for Joe. Thanks for preparing yourself. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, so I see a lot of new faces. Who actually saw the first part of this talk? Very few. Wow, this is going to be interesting. Um, so as Brad mentioned, this is, and I just mentioned two, I guess, this is uh, Learning Vue.js part two. I came to find out that I should have called this part do. <laughs> Screwed that up. Uh, the first part of this, I talked about, uh, extensively talked about how Vue works, and I had planned to get to Vue Router, Vue X, Router, Vue Router, obviously the Router part of it, Vue X, the state management in Vue. Um, but there wasn't enough time. The, the talk went like an hour and a half, and people got restless, and we all had to leave. Uh, so for part two, I plan to very quickly kind of go over the view parts again. So this shouldn't be completely um, foreign territory to the people that didn't make the first part. Uh, but it's going to happen fast. So if you have questions, please ask them. Um, before we jump into it, as Brad mentioned, my name is Joe. Uh, I work at Elastic. Um, if you've heard of Elastic Search, that is our product. I work on a tool called Kibana, which is a uh, browser-based data visualization tool for data in Elasticsearch. My handle is Weevil everywhere. Um, and I, I come to find out today, actually, that apparently I am Arizona's view expert. I have proof. <laughs> uh, but it, to my knowledge, I, I don't know anybody else that's done view talks in the Valley, and this is my second one. Um, <laughs> So, you could call me beautiful, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> a little obscure reference, but it came into my head when I was putting slides together, so I had to, had to put that together. Um, what we're going to get into, as I said, we're going to crash course uh, Vue.js. Uh, so we'll go over some basics, how it works, how state management works. Um, not really deep, but it should be enough to kind of wet your whistle. Uh, then we'll dive into Vue Router and uh, Vuex. Uh, this is the order that I ended up learning this stack. Um, the, much like in React, oh, so I should start this way, who has not used like React or Angular or Vue or anything and is totally new to all of these things? <laughs> that is a lie. So one, okay. Um, some of the things I say might not make sense. If, if you're confused or whatever, please ask. Uh, I'm happy to clarify. Um, how many people have used Vue at all? Just the people I know in this room, interesting. Um, all right, so this should be fun. Uh, so what is Vue? Vue builds itself as a progressive JavaScript framework, or the progressive JavaScript framework. Uh, and what the author meant by this is that you don't have to set up like some big build system and stuff to start using it. You can literally just drop Vue.js on a page off of a CDN. There's a URL that you can get right from their website and just start using it. Um, you don't, you can, you basically augment existing HTML with it. Um, you can do larger build systems with it. It's pretty simple to get started. Uh, Vue's template language is literally just HTML. Uh, if you're familiar with custom elements, um, web components, things like this, it's gonna look really familiar. Uh, in fact, as far as web components go, they have a thing called Vue components. And the structure of these is very similar to web components. So you're putting, uh, this is impossible to read, so I'm just gonna point to what this is. Uh, the top section here, I have uh, all of my HTML, all of my markup. Uh, the middle here is the script that runs my template, any state, any changes, uh, actions that, could, that occur to change that state. And then I can also put uh, CSS in this file. Um, so I get to package all these things up in a single file, single component. Um, it it's, ends up being a really nice experience. Uh, interestingly, because this requires the use of Webpack, you get to piggyback on all the powers of Webpack as well. Um, again, I realize nobody can read this, but this actually is not CSS, this is SCSS. Um, and all I need to do to enable that is turn on the, um, better, <laughs> thank you. Um, turn on the, the node SAS integration in Webpack and add a, a lang property and I'm done. Uh, if I wanted to write my script in CoffeeScript for some crazy reason, I can do that. If I wanted to write my templates in Jade or some other HTML uh, compile to language, that is also possible. Um, all I need to do is add a few things to my build step, and I can do that. Pretty neat. Uh, very few other things can claim that. Uh, it's part of the probably the thing I like the most about Vue. Um, as far as the script for the templates, or if, sorry, for the components, um, you effectively have 
your state and then ways to change your state. So the state is defined as a data object. Um, you, any, any properties that the component needs to, uh, to render itself, to change, whatever, uh, goes into this data object. If you want to make changes to that data object, you do it through methods and you simply mutate that data object. Um, that mutation bit is really important to understand. You can't copy it, you can't do, if you're familiar with Redux where you have to return a new object all the time, do not do that in Vue. Vue does not work that way. What Vue does is it takes that data object, it wraps it up in uh, a collection of getters and setters. And when you change the property on it, it actually will notify the component that something changed and that's what triggers the re-render. So unlike in React where you have, you have to call set state and say, yeah, I'm changing the state, this is the new value of the state, and that triggers a re-render, um, it's that mutation that triggers it. It just kind of happens automatically. Um, so mutation, super important. It's gonna be really important when we get into the state part as well. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a, a bit of a diagram of what I just mentioned, but basically you, you have your component, uh, you have actions that you trigger from that component, button clicks or scrolling events, things like this. Uh, those things mutate the state, and that mutation causes the view to update. That's the whole flow of view components. And to show you how this works, uh, let's look at a little live demo. So the, the kind of quintessential example that you'll see in all the documentation is a little uh, counter thing. Um, you'll see this kind of everywhere that you see view code. You've got, can you folks read that in the back? Is that okay? A little bigger with the eyes. Let's give that a shot. Yes? Better? Okay. Um, so what we have here, again, um, I have this data object. It happens to be a function that's returning an object. It's a, it's a requirement to use a view component, but effectively it's just an object. Uh, I have a count property in it. The initial state of this is zero. And then I have two methods, increment, decrement, or decrement, um, which just mutate that count property. And those actions are tied to click events on a couple of buttons. So if we come down here and look at the actual interface, interface for this, uh, I click inc increments, it changes the value of count. Because I'm using uh, count in the markup here, it changes what's displayed uh, in the HTML. Um, I can also add other things in here. So we can have like a button that, uh, I don't know, we'll say like add 10, right? And so I can have a cl on click, we will call, um, I don't know, set value. We'll give it some sort of number. Then we can add this method here of set value, which will take a value and it will mutate the count uh, property and we'll just add the value to it. And so now when that compiles and I click on this button, it starts uh, increasing by 10. Um, I also can do fun things like bind uh, properties on the class project. So we can do like a uh, BTN danger and I have to quote that for that to work because this is an object. And we'll do it when count is greater than 20. So now when it goes over 20, this button turns red. Fun little stuff, right? Um, so that that is Vue in a nutshell. Um, because Vue's template language, again, is just HTML, uh, I can actually bootstrap Vue on top of a, a component on the page. So we see here, uh, I've, I've set up this view component. There's no actual template in the component itself, but I'm saying I want you to use this element on the page which maps to the ID uh, of the HTML that's already on the page. So that's kind of my view crash course. Any questions on that? It's totally cool to ask questions. Yes? So at click is gonna activate the view code backend, right? So when you say at click is equal to set value 10, it's gonna call set Right. Okay. Just yeah. It, it it so because I'm using uh, this is like a shorthand for uh, what is it? I always beyond. use shorthand beyond okay. colon click. I think. Okay. Now now that makes sense. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's a shorthand. Yeah. So okay. it, for event binding, you can oh. do at uh, whatever the event is, and that's that'll bind the event. Right. Um, also for data binding, uh, what's the normal one? V something. It's V. If you bind, maybe I don't. I don't yeah, know what it is. Anyway, I use a shorthand for everything. I don't remember what the what the actual long form of it is. Um, yeah, the shorthand for beyond is just at. Okay. With, with the uh, click yeah. oh, sorry. You started. All right. Uh, with the click hand builder, you, I see that in the increment, uh, increment and decrement buttons, you aren't calling it with parentheses, but in the click one on the button, you are. Yep. Uh, is that it's just optional? You give you. 
return a function and let's execute that function. That's right. Part of your link. Yeah. So if it, unless I need to pass a value into it, I don't have to actually give it the prends. But it still works both ways. Yeah. So it sees that it is a function and it'll just call it. Mm -hmm. So it, it knows when it's evaluated in the template language um, because we put that prefix on like the click handler or the data uh, or the, like down there have the class. So I'm, it's because the, the template says I am binding some value to this attribute. When it gets evaluated, it, it knows to check like does this thing exist in my state? Is it a method? Is it a property? Whatever this thing is. Um, and it'll, it'll throw errors and stuff if you get that stuff wrong. So is, is it are only, only the values from this view instance is available to this template? Right? Correct. Like if you had multiple view instances, you couldn't, you, you can't access multiple things or find multiple view instances to the same component or anything like that? Right? No, uh, yeah, the, the components are uh, pretty isolated. Um, so it's a lot like React, right? Where you're, you're just composing things as small pieces and then you just kind of collect all these things together. Right. Yeah? Uh, what is the purpose of the the data object in the view? Is that just for the value of initial vision measure? What is that? So the, the data object is um, the component state. So have you used React or uh, Angular or anything before? Angular. Angular? Um, so the data bit kind of maps similar to scope, um, or specifically the scope is being, um, it's not necessarily bit what's passed in, props are closer to that. It's effectively like scope, right? So I could say like like this dollar sign scope dot some property, right, and give it a value. Uh, that's effectively what you're doing here. And much like with React, or uh, sorry, much like with Angular, when you change that value, um, Angular does some dirty checking and stuff. Vue does not do dirty checking. It's actually that setter that triggers the component uh, reset. Okay. Does, the does that initial, make sense? It's the initial data. Yeah, it's the initial, it's like yeah. The live data. Right. Uh, and it's also important to note that you if you know you need a property in your state, but you don't necessarily need to use it right away, you still should put it in that data object because otherwise Vue doesn't know how to wrap that object up correctly. So if you start shoving stuff into state, it won't have the setters on it and changing it won't trigger an update. Yeah. Can you make that, is that private right now? Is that I honestly don't know, I don't think it is. I don't have a paid account, so it can't be <laughs> private. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you actually want to play with this? Yeah, like, you don't have to you? Account, yeah, it has your picture. It's, it, it's not a paid account, it's just a, a paid yeah. Okay. All right, so it's cap, capital K, K Q, 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 Y, Q, Y D, A, M. Damn. Also, I just realized I'm not recording any of this. An existing DOM element, can you suck the state out of that DOM element? Can you suck the state out of that DOM element? What do you mean by that? Like, I have a HTML table. Mm -hmm. And I want that to be my state, and I just want to attach my component to that table. And oh, and read what's pull already. Pull out all of the things and, and use that going forward. <sighs> no, um, you you might be able to like hack that, but yeah, and I don't even think you could. So jQuery inside that data method that does that thing. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, because you're you're. I mean, I guess technically you could set up the initial data as just an empty array go and read those values off of your pre-rendered table and shove them into data, and that, that would actually work. Um, it would I don't, render everything though. Yeah, I don't know why you would do that though, because you would lose all the, you wouldn't be able to like, you, you, you step outside of Vue's uh, kind of life cycle. You do it right? for server-set rendering. Yeah. Sure. Are you trying to solve like an SEO thing? But, like, no. something gets served. I'm right. just thinking I have a table and I want to add sorting to that. Table. Right, yeah. So I just want to, slap a control over the top of it. Like progressive enhancement, basically. Yeah, yeah as, as far as I know, you can't do that. I don't try to okay. do that. Um, it may be worth showing what the HTML compiled is to get that crazy link. That was really valuable to me. I don't have that handy. Yeah. Because this part of this wasn't supposed to be very deep onto you, but it is what it is. So the HTML <laughs> compiled sure. at compile time, or at build time, I suppose, on Webpack into a big block of JavaScript in the same way that JSX compiles into a big block of JavaScript that then gets executed in the same kind of um, virtual DOM type concept. So that HTML, in reality, doesn't really exist at run, at initial runtime, only at actual runtime. And that's that one that the uh, DOM, the virtual DOM that you run. But the selector like would work at runtime, right? Like, it would yeah, but it, it compiles the HTML at, at when it boots up, basically, right. when the component boots. It doesn't serve that HTML, it serves the JavaScript. Right. 
It knows about the relationship between this HTML and that JavaScript? That's the point of using a uh, view component. The view component will package the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS all into one kind of... If you were just using this exact example, though, it wouldn't know the relationship between them, right? I don't know. It, so, it wouldn't. I think what it does is it compiles the template and then blows away whatever's there currently. Yeah, yeah. I don't imagine. Uh, or it actually probably doesn't blow it away because it's still a VDOM, right? So, it can still diff whatever it thinks the DOM should be versus what's there currently. The questions? <coughs> All right. Push forward. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't. Cool. So that was Vue. Um, now, Vue Router. Who does not know what a front end router does or what it's used for, or any of that sort of stuff? If I said I'm using a router and that doesn't make sense to you, please raise your hand. Awesome. So. The router is uh, uh, obviously for just being able to conditionally load components uh, based on the URL. Uh, and I apparently don't need to dive into that too deeply. So what does that look like? Uh, we have here just kind of mock browser things, mock little interface. Um, here I have two components. I've got this user details component, and inside of that I've got this profile component. And I have this route that I, I that's not really a real route. It would probably be slash user slash you know some ID or some name or something. Um, but I can think of it as, you know, whatever that thing after the user is, is some parameter that I want to use to uh, determine what data I'm going to load into these components. Uh, so what does this look like? Uh, how do we set this up with ViewRouter? The ViewRouter is, um, it's defined as an object. Uh, your routes are just an array of other objects. So this is a router uh, for an application I'll show you in a little bit uh, later in this talk. Um, it has four routes. It's a really, really simple app. Uh, basically, if if we're matching slash, I'm going to load uh, this home component, so on and so forth. Um, the path and the component are really the only two that are required here. Uh, because I've given all of these things a name, it allows me to refer to the name uh, of the route that I want to load as opposed to the path of the route that I want to load, which is kind of useful. Um, because then if my application ever changes, I can just update the path on the router and the application will just continue to work with the like new path. Or... What's up? In links? Yeah, so there's there's like a, a route link, uh, which is Actually, I don't have that in this demo, but. That's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's cool. yeah. Um, so this is just a really flat structure. Um, the way that we use the router with Vue, um, when we, before we start up our, our kind of top level Vue component uh, piece, we have to tell Vue to use the Vue router. So use is kind of uh, an interesting thing in Vue. It's similar to middleware uh, in Express, if you're familiar with that. Um, it basically allows you to decorate the view instance with uh, some additional functionality. So in the case of view router, it will it knows how to handle uh, the router property on the view instance uh, once it's created. It will inject some custom components for actually handling the routes, uh, for knowing what route you're on, showing which route is active, and things like this. Um, this is all it takes. Uh, again, going back to the, the template compiling and all that sort of stuff, view does also have a render function, um, which has, it, it's required to be a function uh, that takes basically a, a create element sort of thing. Uh, so if this was React, you'd basically have create element, uh, app, some properties on that thing, and then whatever child components you had. It's the same structure. Um, so when you, when you see the HTML, what Vue is compiling it into is a thing that gets shoved into a create element, much like JSX turns that into JavaScript. Um, bit of a tangent, but anyway. So, um, here, we're back at the same route. Uh, I have this kind of user slash ID thing. Um, this is like the, the root level thing, right? But it's not super interesting. Uh, having a flat route isn't super interesting either. Chances are, uh, I want to do some deeper things, right? I have, uh, in this case, I'm, you know, if I don't have any other parameters in the URL, I'm just going to show the user profile. But say I wanted to be able to allow the user to see all of their posts or all of their comments or something. Um, I probably want to tack some other property onto the URL and just make that happen. And we note here that if, like, if I look between these two, it's effectively the same thing. I, I'm still definitely using the same user uh, details component. I'm just changing what's inside of here. So the way that that's achieved in Vue Router is by defining children on the top level route. So the route, the structure doesn't change. You still have this, uh, this kind of top level route with a path and a component. Um, but you can also define children uh, that are going to render inside of that top level component. So here I have this user component. Uh, I'm saying that if I don't have anything else on the URL, render this user home piece, uh, or effectively the user profile uh, that we saw, inside of the top level user, like the user details page. 
Um, and then if I have a post on the end of that URL, then render the user post component. Does that make sense? And then the way that that works is inside of my user component, uh, I would use this custom element that the view router uh, gave me called this router view. So anytime that you have uh, a child component that you want to render inside of another component, you just tap this, uh, this router view um, component in the markup, and it will inject the child component in that point. So I can wrap, uh, you can imagine like uh, a larger application might have like a top nav that is changing depending on where I am. It might have uh, a sidebar or some, some other sort of navigation that's going on, some other content that might be shown or hidden. Um, you can specify all of that as uh, these router view bits, and you can also name uh, the views of uh, the views that you want to inject. So if I said like this was router view name, uh, I don't even know what I would call this thing because it doesn't make sense to have anything else on this page. But you, you might yeah, you might have like a top nav name or a sidebar name or something like that. Like um, slots. Yeah, it's effectively like slots. Or if you're if you're familiar with Angular Transclusion, um, very similar idea. Um, but it's a, it's a way to wrap components and inject other components inside of it, uh, just by using the different routes. But I've shown you uh, a user page, so presumably um, I, I need to be dealing with some sort of authorization, right? I, I want to know, is this user authorized? Should this user be seeing this page? Um, or should I be sending them maybe to a login page or something? So View Router doesn't actually handle authorization out of the box, uh, or not, not directly anyway. Uh, what it does let you do is attach metadata to your routes, and you can read that metadata um, based on the route and how it matched. So here we have, this is exactly the same route that we had before, except I've put a meta property on here, and inside of that I've put uh, requires authentication. That property doesn't mean anything. The router doesn't do anything with that value. I could have called that bubbles true or something. It doesn't, doesn't matter what I called it, uh, except that it makes sense for when I go and consume it elsewhere in my code. So the way that this works is uh, the router also has life cycles. And one of those life cycles is a before each. So what happens is as the, the router sees that the URL changes, this function gets called. And it's given uh, an object of the route that you're about to navigate to, the route that you're coming from, and then a next function which you can use to continue the route or to break that route and send the user somewhere else. So all I do here is uh, part of that two object is a matched property, which is just an array of all the routes that we matched. Um, it's interesting to note that it doesn't just give you, uh, say I, I went to you know, user ID post, it doesn't just give me this component, the match actually matches that and that. So it will walk through, it will actually give me all of the routes that matched up to that point. And I can iterate over those and check to see uh, if I have a meta property of requires authentication. And if I do, it says that, yeah, this, this route requires auth. So uh, if I go into this conditional, I can, auth is just some made up service. Uh, I basically check to see, is this user authenticated? If they are, uh, I just call next and it, the route just keeps going. If they're not authenticated, uh, I can pull some information off of the route that they're trying to navigate to, so that once they log in, I can send them back into that flow. Um, that's really all this code is doing here. And then in, in the next call, instead of just calling next, I give it another route that I want to send the user to. So in this case, uh, I have this hypothetical login component, uh, or login route, rather, uh, that I've named login. Uh, I attach some other data to it. In this case, I called it query, which is a terrible name for this property, but it is what it is. Um, and when, it, when I navigate to the login component, I will have access to that query data. Make sense so far before I dive into how this login component's gonna work? Yeah? Can I get access to my main view? Um, component from there. What do you mean the main view component? The um, app dot view. Uh, it depends how your app is structured. Um, so yes, uh, if if the app dot view is like your entry point to the whole application, and it's in there that you're using the router to inject other components, um, yeah, the the app view thing will load, and it will expect you um, to give it some other content to load inside of there. Um, so you, you want to have like a fallback in your router to say like well, if you didn't match any routes like send them to the home page or something right? I'm inside the before each. Can I get access to that app dot view instance so that I can then you know go query in the state that I put in there? If the if the app is part of your route, then yes. So if you had like a top level route that was just slash, 
and you said, I want to render you know, this app component into Slash, inside of, like, then I would have a child component of Slash user, mm -hmm. uh, and have a child uh, component in there or whatever, yes, then that, it would match that entire tree. But that wouldn't include the state in that Docker component, would it? So no, it, yeah, it doesn't, you don't, you don't actually get the component instance. The router is just the route definition. Mm -hmm. It's more like the, the route, the component that will render eventually, because before rendering ever happens, right? Right. So there is no state available at the beginning. Okay. Where, where would what, you store? Yeah. What would you want to? Well, what would you want to do out of that app? That top level app thing. I'm thinking like the way Angular roots go for us. Is that your thing? I want to stash whether these are authenticated as a property in my main app, and then in this um, before each, go read that. You know, auth dot whatever is an ins interesting service, but if that service is reactive, if you can't like yeah. embed that value in your view, then your view won't react as auth right. dot. So, so you don't have to worry about that at this phase, because this is before the component is rendered. So the component doesn't exist at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the auth service, I should probably go back to that code as I talk about it. The auth service can be anything. Uh, the first time that I was using uh, View and View Router, my auth service was literally just a function that had some properties in it that was stateful itself, um, but I didn't have like some you know crazy state management or whatever. It was just this, this module um, that you know returned true or false whether or not the user happened to be authenticated. So that gets managed uh, outside of the the component lifecycle. It gets managed outside of the routing lifecycle. Um, it's you might, like, if, if you're thinking about this in React or something, you might throw it into, you know, Redux or something. You might just have a standalone thing or whatever. It doesn't, the, the auth thing doesn't have to have anything to do with view. It doesn't have to be reactive. It doesn't have to know that you're using it in view. It's just a service that you're calling. You're about to get some imputed properties, which I imagine is how you pull that into view. Yeah, so if, if you wanted to, um, yeah, if you wanted to make that property available from some external service that, that view knew nothing about, but you wanted to make it available in your component so that it was reactive, there are computer properties uh, that allow you to do that, which I'll show a little example of in a little bit. Plus another hand. No? Cool. All right, so this login component, um, yeah, actually, there's, thank you. There was a computer, computer property on this component, so this is a pretty good uh, example. So uh, it's easier to, to talk about this kind of from the bottom up, so mostly because I wrote this poorly. Um, Created is a lifecycle on the components. Uh, so when the component is injected into the page, the created uh, function, the created method, whatever, gets called. And when that occurs, I can do something uh, to maybe inject some other state or trigger a route change or something uh, before that component happens, uh, before that component gets mounted, rather, sorry. So what I can do is in here, I can check to see, this is just an example of using uh, Vuex store. It doesn't have to be Vuex. It's a, again, it doesn't have to be view aware at all. This is just some external service that I can ask, is this user authenticated? And if they are, then I can hit uh, the router from inside of here. So another thing that view router does when you do the view.use is inject um, this, this dollar sign router as well as dollar sign routes uh, into the state of all the components in, under that tree. So I have access to the router, and I can say if this user's already authenticated, I can replace this route with uh, the place that they came from, right? So I can assume that when the, the first time I checked, um, if they got in some weird state or whatever, um, I can send them away from the login page, they're already logged in, I can send them back to where they were trying to go. And the send to thing is actually a computed property. And computer properties are effectively just getters which means that I can execute code to figure out what the value I want to return from that getter is. So in here, I happen to, I'm, I'm just checking the, uh, the route's query. The query is the property that I assigned earlier, and that's why it's a terrible name, because query actually means something in routing. Um, but anyway, I can check to see, do I have a previous property or a redirect on it? If I have either, I can just say, like, yeah, I, I'm going to send it to this named route, or I'm going to send the user to this path, a specific path. Um, otherwise, I can just, if I don't have either of those things, I can just send them to app, which theoretically is just a top level like home page of my application. Um, and every time I try to read uh, this dot send to, this function gets executed. And so again, the context of this function has nothing to do with the use lifecycle. So if I wanted to read uh, some other properties outside of the use kind of scope or lifecycle or um, state management, I can do that as a compute property. Does that make sense? But you won't know when the values that you read in your send to compute property update. Correct. 
Uh, so yeah, it's 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 interesting. Or it's important to note that the computed property will only be computed once, until some uh, stateful property out of here gets read again, mm -hmm. or it changes rather. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, right, what happens with computer read on that property again? Yeah. Or whatever. Well, it's it's so it's hard to explain. I don't fully understand how the computer properties work. The next, the next um, time a write happens on any stateful property, in a computer property. property that exists inside of the computed uh, method, it will run again. So the first time it runs the computed method, it keeps track of all the stateful properties in right. there, yeah. and then captures a, uh, a callback yeah. on any of those writes. Right, <coughs> thank you. That was our understanding of what we learned last time. Yeah, so I, I looked into it after that talk, yeah, and that, yeah. that's exactly what it does. It, it, it can actually see, like, it knows when you started executing that function, and it'll check to see what state values you're reading off of, and it caches both of those things together. So it builds a graph that passes, yep. but yep. if you don't have the values in your graph because those values are just from some auth service that's like on window. Right. Then then, then yeah, then the computer property won't them, change again. Which is what which is I assume is why you would use something like store.getters so that it becomes stateful and then you can track it by using this global location to put data. Um, I honestly don't know if reading off the store will cause a computer property to change either. That's a good question. I've never thought about it. In this case, it doesn't matter because I only ever care like, do they have somewhere to send them one time, right? right? I only care the first time that this thing loads. So once it's computed, I can use the computed value over and over. If the template instead but, though had like a condition in the template that said like, if you're authenticated, show this branch. If you're not authenticated, show this other branch. Then a change to whether or not you're authenticated would be correct. Yeah, important. yeah, yeah. If right, you'd have to you'd have to reboot the, um, the component or something like that. Have like some counter that you can even just right. like, trigger something. <laughs> Yeah. So your store there, that would be something like UX? Yes. So to speak. What so in, in, in this particular piece of code, yes, that is exactly where that store is coming so, from. So particularly, that's like, because uh, it seems a lot like React in that sense. Like, that seems like if you were using something like Redux, that would be your store, right? And mm -hmm. then once a property changes on that, that would initiate a re-render of that component if any of the state that that thing was using changed. Yeah, I, I, which I would, ha I would imagine because most it of the does. Like, yeah, because yeah. when when the store when the store changes, and again it changes by mutation, yeah. which is why I stressed the mutation part earlier. Um, yeah, that that will trigger an update. Um, but it, it happens because you're. Well, it does happen in the computer property, so it must. Yeah, yeah. yeah when yeah. that value, so when, when if you here if the send to computer property accessed this dot store instead of this dot route, it would the computer property would have a dependency on this dot store dot getters dot is authenticated. Right. And that dependency would mean that when it's authenticated changes in the store, it, you, you would know that the send to computer property needs to be recalculated because yep. that's dependency property. Yep. So you're doing so, the, the routing of what a user sees after after they've been authenticated in this component. You could do that when they're being authenticated as well in the router. Yeah. So um so that wouldn't happen in the router, that would happen in the component. And that actually does happen here. So, so this is basically just boot up logic, right? So when this component's mounting, I'm checking to see, is the user actually authenticated? If they are, don't show them the login screen. Okay. Um, when, when they do authenticate, though, I need to do something else, right? I need to, uh, whatever the external service is, I need to say, yeah, this user is now authenticated. I need to check with that super, ser yeah, service to see that the credentials they gave me are valid. Um, and then I need to send them back where they came from, right? So this is like the top level uh, component. Yeah, so this, this is like the whole login component, okay. um, which is why like there's an email and a password here, and there's a bad login flag, which I can show a message and say, yeah, those credentials don't work. Um, and so the way that that works is uh, when, the, when this hypothetical theoretical form gets submitted, it will call this, um, this do login method. And from there, I can read uh, whatever value the user's typed in the email and password fields, um, I can then ask, uh, so this dispatch bit is more Vuex stuff, but basically I can ask some external service, hey, given these credentials, are these valid? And if they are, uh, this problem is gonna resolve, I'll then push uh, the route that they came from into the router, and it will redirect the user back to uh, the flow that they were expecting uh, before I ask them to log in. And if it fails, I just trigger this bad login message, um, which will you know, conditionally show something up in the, in the template. Sense? Other questions? Ooh. 
Could you imagine writing a uh, view before you had an airplane trip? <laughs> I can hardly imagine writing anything in JavaScript before arrow functions existed. Uh, or, or for that matter, like object spreading is kind of amazing. Uh, um, all right, so that is uh, the router. That's kind of uh, an intro to authentication. I wanted to show authentication because it's something that I struggled with uh, when I was first getting started with this. Uh, so hopefully now you know at the very least that you can attach meta properties to your routes and check those properties to see uh, to, to do authentication. If you're, uh, if you're routing, uh, or you had the routes defined, if you're chilling routes, can you undo a lot of those? Can you separate those out? You yeah, separate so uh, because the route definition is just an array, um, so like it's an array of objects, right? Yeah, yeah. So I could uh, basically just have one router instance and you know, set up an array of various objects or whatever elsewhere in a bunch of different router files or whatever, and then somewhere at some like root level, just shove all of those objects together into a single array and then go with the, the router that way. And usually for larger applications, that's what I end up doing. Can you still name the children? Yeah, yeah. And, and everything's just like a unique name, there's no like, yep. hierarchy to get to this one. Can you get access to store inside the for each? In the, in the router? The for each? Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's where you would store the local position. Oh, sorry, in the, in the router for each. I don't know. I've never tried it. Why wouldn't you be able to use JavaScript, right? Well, it depends on the... It gets um, passed into this context. Yeah, it gets passed into the prototype, or not the prototype, the... Um, the state. The, the state, the... There's a different word for that, anyway. Snowball. So if you have... Wow. You, have you if there is a variable... <laughs> Are you setting up stakes and scope up to a for each? I mean, yeah, so. Uh, it's, uh, it's JavaScript, right? So it should work. No, because it's, it's well, and actually here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that store is not available in the router hook because I can, I don't know, maybe it is. If I, if I actually pass in a real function, then I could attach scope to that function. You could, you could attach scope to it. Well, it might, router, if, what router. I mean is, is, because I could, the view might do it in the background. Right. Because I'm using the arrow function here specifically, I can't use this. But this well, I could, but it's not going to be this side I want. The router could very yeah. well be a location that, does, that is enhanced by the store. Right. But the store itself would have to probably reach out to the router and inject that property or something like that. So that it well, would be So the router here, right? Maybe I missed the question. Um, or maybe I'm not, I didn't understand the question. Well, are you asking, can you access state from the store? Within this before each. Yeah. So he's so here in the uh, in the login component, I'm doing uh, where is it? This this store, you know, some other thing, on, uh, some other mm -hmm. UXy thing, right? Yeah. And this this gets injected automatically, and it gets attached to the component scope. But in in the router, I don't know if the router gets that, if that gets attached to the router. Yeah, so can you just simply where you're doing this before each? The store is separate from, per se, the. It is. Yeah, so you can just access it. Oh, is it like yeah, so it's, it's something you like initialize and you have yeah. access to outside the components. Yeah, so, so you should be able to use it here. Oh. Because You're right. If, if I made not yeah, if I made the store itself. component uh, available in the like scope of the file that is defining this router, mm -hmm. then yeah, I, I could use the store that way. You could like import the store technically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's injected to, to scope on all the components yeah. as well, so you don't have to import it everywhere. Yeah. But right. It is important. But you, yeah, you can just access it. Yep. I imagine you could like carry it around and, and like sure. lazily pass it around so when it does boot, it's in the scope or something. You, yeah, I mean, you probably could just like monkey patch it in yeah. here. I don't know if there's a whole lot of value. Um, I've never tried to do it, so I don't know for sure. I don't know whether or not it, it actually is available. But yeah, you but could. The idea of doing the, the check for, rec but if you had the requires authentication information stored on your store. Right. Yeah. Then you could do this check in the router dot before each. That's true. You'd have to do unless it. I unless I've made the store instance uh, exposed somewhere in this right. file. Or you like had this as the created callback on the root component that's at the root of every single route. Right. That's another option, I guess. Is yeah. Or I could do it on that, like a top level component. Or something right. Too, so right? Like at the top route, there's like a like router container, and then the children is where your actual whole application lives. And then at, in the created call for that top level. Do this, and then you have access to the stuff stored. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, so the lifecycle that component isn't going to change though. So even if you put it in an updated hook, that component doesn't change. The route changes, but that 
like the top level app component doesn't get re-rendered, just the stuff inside of it does. That's fine. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to check like you know once the user has logged out, you wouldn't know that that changed. Oh, yeah, you have to use a. You need you need some other way to like tell this thing that it's updated. Well, you, you, so your 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 render function could either return a, re a render or a router view, or it could return a log. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the way I've done it with Vuex in the before each is just to make the store instance exposed. Yeah, um, like because it, it's what you get on uh, this store. It's just the instance that you return and inject it into the view inst into the uh, yeah the view instance. The What's up? Same thing you pass into view.use? Yep. Uh, view.use gets view x. But, but you, you, it's here. That's actually like the next section. Higher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, state. Uh, does anybody have any other questions about the router or whatever before we move on? Too late. Move it on. Uh, so, view x, the state bit. Um, if you are familiar with uh, Redux or you're familiar with, uh, I guess, to some extent, services in Angular, um, the Vuex sort of fits the same bill. It's closer to the React ecosystem than it is the Angular system. Um, the life cycle of it is not that different than uh, an actual view component's life cycle. So as I noted earlier, uh, in view we have our view component, we trigger some actions, actions mutate state, that mutation tells the component that it needs to update. When we introduce Vuex, uh, it doesn't change the flow much, but it does add another step, this mutation step. So your view component will trigger an action in the store instead of in itself. Um, it would, that's, that action would commit a mutation to the state. That state would get mutated and the component sees that the state changed and will cause a re-render. Um, it's neat because the, this mutation step is a little weird. It, it, it bugs me a little bit that both of these things exist, but I, I understand why they exist and I, um, anyway. The mutation bit is interesting because DevTools can hook directly into it, and so they can keep track of like the mutations that occurred in the state, um, and you can roll them back because you can just replay those mutations, even if they were... So the reason that, that actions and mutations are separated is because actions allow you to do asynchronous things, which Redux doesn't come out of the box with, and it's super annoying. Um, so if I say uh, I was doing a login thing, right, and I, I triggered an action to say like, hey, try to log this user in, of course that's gonna be asynchronous because I'm gonna go talk to an API and I'm gonna have to wait for the response from that API. Once I get the response back, I trigger a mutation saying, yeah, this user is authenticated, and then the component triggers the, you know, if I have a, um, uh, the hook in there for to trigger the router, all that stuff occurs. Uh, but it's that mutation that is important. It's, it, that's what's actually changing the state. It's not actually the action that changes the state. In fact, if you try to change the state in an action, it will yell at you. You not you you do have access to the state in an action, but you are not supposed to mutate it in the action. You need to pass it off to a mutator. Hopefully, so that, that makes does sense. Does that mean that you have like an activity log in your dev tools? Yes. Unlike in Redux, where you just have that long list of the entire application global state. The, the Redux Dev Tools show, they, they yeah, it shows all the, uh, yeah, they have like diffing and all that sort of stuff in it. Uh, the view tools are a little nicer though. It's been a little while since I've used this. So, this reducer is just like the reducer? Uh, sort of, except, so in, in Redux, you have your reducer, and what your reducer is doing is returning a brand new object. And the, re the reason you do that is because uh, React components are doing this, uh, this strict equality check on the object, right? So it can check to see like if, if this object is not the object that I had before, then I know I need to re-render myself, right? With view, uh, you mutate that object. So much like in your component state, you, you have to use mutation in order to trigger a change, you have to do the same thing in Vuex as well. And that's why it's called a mutation and not like a reduction or some sort of, sort of other thing like that. You're explicitly mutating the state. They seem kind of like the second half of action. Yeah, like in Redux, it's, it, it fits, as far as the life cycle goes, it fits in the same part as Reducer would, but you're not doing the same thing. I don't know. It's the same workflow, it's just semantically different. Yeah, in the sense you, that you do something different. Exactly. But I guess you still get the same outcome, so to speak, right? Versus I may return you an instance of what the state or the world looks like now. Here I'm just saying, okay, I'm changing the world right now, Right. and then you're going to re-render it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so where this deviates from Redux a little bit as well is Redux is only synchronous. You can fake asynchronicity by triggering two actions, right? With, with Vuex, mutations are synchronous, but actions don't matter. So I can do asynchronous stuff. It doesn't matter how long it took to resolve, whatever. Um, it's not until that mutation happens. The mutations do have to be synchronous that things uh, re-render, that changes occur. That's what I mean by it sounds like it's the second half of the action. So, like mutations are just like the actions that you dispatch as a result of your action, asynchronous action completed. Right. It's the like success and failure action that you have exactly. baked inside of your Redux actions for like the start action that comes from the view and the success and failure ones. Those are the mutations. Yep. Are more explicit from the actions perspective, like actually make this change rather than saying this arbitrary op operation is completed. And now the producer chooses what the mutation looks like by returning a completely different state. Right. You keep, you keep the, the modification to state more local to the action, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, so you, you end up bundling both together, mm -hmm. uh, which is nice because then you. Extraction interaction is a lot more understandable. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, and you can, you can keep stuff a lot smaller. Um, you can. There's like modules and stuff, you can build all these components together and namespace them. So instead of having like in Redux where every action and every reducer has to have a unique name, in Vuex it doesn't matter because you can namespace all the things that live under a certain domain. And so if this thing is called um, you know, update user and this thing is called update user, it doesn't matter as long as they live in different spaces, uh, which Vuex makes really easy to do. Um, so, uh, I got tired of writing slides, and I thought it'd be more interesting to like just do the Vuex thing as a live coding example. Um, so that is this part of the talk. Uh, what I'm going to do is start up uh, a little view server, and I could think and type at the same time. That'd be awesome. Um, and a little React or a little Node server, rather. And what I have here is. And some stuff in here. So this is like a, a crypto coin price value tracking thing, uh, right? So what this does is you can just arbitrarily say like, I have you know X number of certain coins of some certain type of uh, cryptocurrency, and it will go and hit, uh, there's a service called Crypto Watch, it will go and hit that API, pull back the price for that coin, and then tell you what the value of the coins you told it you are holding is. Uh, really, really simple, the, uh, the local host server, is just a little demo server uh, things. So when it hits that API, this is the data that's coming back. It's just a, an array of objects. Um, and that's literally all that's occurring here. So pull this down and show the network tab. So when it hits the holdings, it pulls this data back. That data um, is updating the component right now. This is just component state and that uh, will update all of these views. And if you watch closely every 30 seconds or so, you'll see this thing kind of, this loading indicator flash down there. Um, and we can all wait silently and hope that it occurs. They just, it they just could? All right, cool. Uh, so now you all believe me. All right, so let's take a look at what we have for this component. So we see here, um, you know what? Let's look at the view code. So we have uh, this dashboard component. Inside of here, we have uh, these four dashboard card things. Um, I have little drop downs here. This is supposed to eventually do something and let me edit it. Now I just have it showing a little notification. Um, so what we have here is, uh, this is the dashboard component. This is the container that is showing those four cards. And what I'm doing is for all of the, uh, the holdings that I got back from the server, I just iterate over each one of those and then um, create an instance of the what, no, of the, uh, the dashboard card. Um, if I have an error state, or uh, sorry, if, if I don't find any holdings on the API, but I didn't get an error, or I'm not in a loading state, then it'll show a message saying I didn't find any holdings. Um, and we can fake that by just not triggering that action when this thing starts. So the application reboot. Uh, I lied, because the loading state starts off being true. Yay, no holdings, right? Um, so what's happening is when this component gets created, um, it's calling this, uh, this fetch method. And when that fetch method uh, resolves, it will uh, just basically set an interview to, uh, interval to keep calling it. Sorry, I thought it was every 30 seconds, it's every 15 seconds. Um, and then it attaches the timer to the uh, state of the component. 
So this fetch method, all it's doing is uh, it sets loading the truth, sets error to false. Uh, this get holdings is some external thing that I wrote, just using just a simple um, call to my RESTful backend. It will return the holdings, and then I shove them onto the component state. So this holdings just set it to holdings and just mutate the array, and then I get my awesome component that I own comment that I did, but I didn't save it. And then everything loads. So uh, what I want to do is, instead of having this local application uh, state, I want to replace this with uh, Vuex state. So I'm going to start off by uh, obviously installing Vuex into this project. I'm fairly certain I already did that, but I should probably double check. So that's going to run, take a few seconds. Um, then what we're going to do is create a new uh, store file. And this file is, we're gonna import uh, Vuex from Vuex. So the Vuex uh, library is what allows us to create a store. Um, we do so by just newing up a Vuex store and giving it an object. This object's gonna take uh, our state, our initial state effectively. Uh, it's gonna take some actions and it's gonna get uh, some mutations as well. Um, that'll make my linter happy. Um, so what do we what do we put in this? Well, if we if we take a look at this and think about what we saw back in the dashboard component, we had something really similar, right? We have our data object, which is our component state, and we have some methods or effectively actions that mutate that state. And that's really um, what we're doing in Vuex as well, except for as I mentioned earlier, the Actions and the mutators are a little bit different. The mutators are actually what's changing the state. The actions are potentially asynchronous things that are triggering mutations. So copying our component state into Vuex state is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, we know that we have this holdings array, so we can shove that into our state. We know that we're gonna have uh, some action, um, yeah, I'm just call this holdings. Um, that is gonna go talk to the server, uh, it's gonna get the values for the coins that we want, and we want, and, sorry, it's gonna get the uh, objects off the server and it's gonna mutate them onto Vuex's state. Um, we can, because I have broken this um, get holdings thing off into its own component, um, we can use this straight up. So we can, uh, it's gonna be a promise, which we might as well return, and that will be important in a moment. Um, then we are going to get some holdings back. You know what, this is all literally the same code out of this method. So this is the important bit. Um, we no longer have to worry about this loading piece because that is uh, the domain of the component and not so much this uh, holdings state. And that's pretty much it. The only other thing, uh, rather, so we could, um, the, the first property that comes into uh, actions is something that Vuex gives you, um, what do they call it, the like scope or something like that? I forget what the terms they use. Uh, what you'll see everybody doing in all the documentation is destructuring off the piece of that that they need. So um, you know, I'm just gonna call it scope because I can't think of a better word for it. And so effectively what we wanna do is, uh, so we can read the state uh, just the actual current value of the uh, state in the store just off of the state property. We can also commit uh, mutations. So we could, if we wanted to, um, I'm just gonna destructure this off just to make things easier later. Uh, we can take the store, sorry, take the state, uh, and just mutate the state in place. And this will technically work, um, but it's gonna yell at you. Because you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to mutate state in your actions. Yeah. What's up? You want to see it happen? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's leave it alone for a while. The linter is going to complain because I'm changing a value that's being passed in, but that's fine. No, I was going to ask: Is that because they want to batch it at some point, or? Yeah. So it's. Um, yeah, uh, what is it, no param? Yes, I can disable. <laughs> I could. <laughs> no, uh, you, you have to say disable in order to disable a specific thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Zero. There it goes. Um, sorry, you asked why you can't mutate any action. I was asking, is it because at some point they want to batch? Is it 
for batching reasons to the deity or? Uh, it's not for batching. Um, it's really just so that you have a, a single place that you can watch for mutations. Um, it's most useful in, as I uh, showed the dialogue earlier, it's most useful for like dev tools and just like watching those mutations. Um, either way, the, the, the state will get mutated and the component will see that it changed and it will re-render. Um, Do you know that that works in production mode too? Or only in production mode? Because they, they might disable that in production That's a good question. Uh, it must work in production mode because I'm running in production mode right now. It didn't say so in production mode. It does complain, but it's, it also complains like if I try to actually use the template, it's like this isn't, well, no, I guess they're different things. This doesn't include the template compiler, but it, it is dev mode. Yeah, so it's probably watching it so that it can come to do the right thing, but in yeah. production mode, they won't actually watch the changes on the screen. It's possible. Um, it used to yell at me, too, and I, I noticed when I was writing this demo that it doesn't yell at you anymore mm -hmm. if you mutate stuff in the action. Um, as far as I know, the, that hasn't changed, though, so I'm just going to tell you at least what the rules used to be, and what I assume they still are, don't mutate things in the actions. Um, but this will work, so we, we can continue that way. Um, so what we need to do now is remove, so we no longer have our holdings on our local component state, and we no longer need to do uh, this get holdings thing, right? We probably have to deal with, uh, we definitely need to deal with like setting this loading back to false. Um, but what we can do is say this uh, store, and we can dispatch, uh, much like in Redux, we dispatch actions, you dispatch actions in Vuex as well. Uh, and we have our update holdings method. And because, uh, so get holdings, is a promise, this returns a promise. Um, when you dispatch an action in Vuex, you actually get the property that you returned out of it. So instead of having to watch for like, oh, like this dispatch thing finished and now I have this like other action handler, I can literally just uh, put uh, a then hook on the end of this and this will work. So in here, I can, you know, if this succeeds, I can set my loading to false, and if it fails, then um, set loading to false as well, and then show the error message. Um, so it's, it, I don't know, I like that part. I like that you can actually get access to the promises that you're creating in the um, actions and use them directly. Are all dispatches promises? No. No, no, the, the, the dispatch, all it's doing is oh, literally calling this function. Value yeah, it's because I am returning a, a uh, promise. So if you were to, instead of updating the state in the uh, action, if you run it through a mutation, when would the promise resolve? The promise would still resolve when this promise resolves. Okay. It's, it's literally returning what I'm returning out of this action. But presumably your state has not mutated yet. Yes. Um, it just so happens to well, that's not true because so, so what I'm gonna, what I would end up doing in here is once this promise resolves, then I would call the mutation, and the mutation is synchronous. So that mutation will happen first before the other side of that promise huh. resolves, so happen, right? Like, because it, it's always a next tick thing. In the line that you execute, the, that you dispatch the mutation, that's when the mutation occurs. Uh, it, it, so like if you had like no. three lines during mutations, will each each of those results? Oh yeah, 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 yes, okay, yes. So the line there where you do the mutation is actually. So that is the next line, the state is updated. Right. Okay. Interesting. So, let's save this, and let's see if we get this right. We didn't. What did we screw up? What did I screw up? Oh, haha, <laughs> we never hooked the store up. So, the other thing we do, remember how we did the, uh, the view use uh, view router? We also need to do the same thing with uh, our view X. Over. So, import Vuex from Vuex, uh, and then we need to use Vuex. The other thing we need to do is pass the store that we created into our uh, view instance. So we're going to import uh, store bucket type from store, um, and then we shove the store thing onto the store property in our component. Now, this looks okay, and logically this should work, it doesn't, uh, and let's watch the error and see why. So we notice when we hook this up, uh, it yells at us, and it says that we must call view use before we create our store instance. So what's happening here is when I import the store file, it immediately executes this code which creates our um, store instance, right? 
And so then by the time I do the view use view X, this store already exists. So uh, instead of calling this store, let's call this create store and we'll make it a function that returns our store instance. Why do you think that and we also need exports. Why do you think that's a requirement? Do you have any I theory? don't know. Uh, I meant to look into it. I didn't quite have enough time uh, before this presentation. Yeah, I, I... Part of this implementation of u.use, that's strange, or... I, yeah. I honestly don't know. I, <laughs> I didn't look it up, so I don't know the answer. Uh, anyway, so now that we create our store later, that part works, but we have some other problems. Don't live code at home, kids. <laughs> uh, let's see, can I read property then of undefined in the dashboard? Are you returning the promise? I am returning that promise. You got an extra comma on the slide. Uh, things and commas are, that's a linting thing. But, but, but. And that is what we call this thing. Yep, that matches. What didn't we do right? What didn't I do right? I keep saying we. You guys had no part in this. <laughs> <laughs> I screwed this up all on my own. You can get credit when it works. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sure so I'm not sure of anything. It's complaining about then of undefined in uh, just all runtimey stuff. Can we get created? You want to create it? Aha! Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have this, this, this fetch function which we were calling here, um, but we are not returning this promise. Now we have a promise, and now we have a then call on that promise. But we have other errors. Uh, only is not defined in the instance, but referenced during the render. Uh, oh, that's the other thing. So now we have uh, our holdings in our state. We have a way to trigger a mutation to that state, but we haven't made those holdings from the state available in this component yet. So the way that we do that is using a computed property. So we have, oops, this is just an object. Uh, we're gonna have a holdings um, method. So this is just a little getter. And here we're just gonna return uh, the store, thank you, uh, holdings. And so now when, um, when I use, in the markup, uh, when I use when I try to read this holdings property off of the uh, components scope, it will now be available because I've made it available as a computed property. Let's save that and screw something else up too. I'm gonna read length of undefined because this thing is not an array. Why isn't this thing an array? This doesn't actually work. State holdings is an empty array, and we are setting it to an array of four objects. You're not returning holdings. Not Where? I guess. Yeah, I don't think the promise is actually going to do You're then on the other side. I don't remember. <laughs> You're then is using the holdings from. No, I guess yeah, yeah, but it's just calling. Okay. It's just calling fetch, and fetch is the only thing that we need to promise on. So previously, when you were doing it, you had this dot store dot getters dot holdings. Is holdings available at the top level of the store? Or is it, it is not. Uh, and I had the getters piece wrong. So getters and state are a little bit different. Um, I can talk about getters in a moment, but what we really want to do is read off of the state property on the store. Um, hooray! <laughs> we did it! We did it! <laughs> Congratulations, everybody! You did it! Uh, Let's see, is this thing gonna yell at me now? Yeah, see it doesn't yell at me, uh, even though I'm mutating the state in the action, it should. Um, and if we look in the, um, yeah. So because I didn't mutate the state in a mutator, the, the debugger didn't see that action, or that mutation actually occur. So the only thing it knows about is the base state, which was the empty array. So even though this thing changed, 
I can't actually debug that anything occurred. So let's fix that part finally. So we're gonna do um, set holdings, uh, another method that is going to take, um, the only thing this thing gets is the state and then whatever we pass into um, this mutation, that's what we're gonna get as a second property. Uh, it's important to note that you can only pass one argument as the second argument. You can't just like, so what I'm gonna do, instead of mutating the state straight up, uh, I'm gonna use commit, and commit will allow me to, um, let's see, set holdings, uh, and then I'm going to pass the holdings into it. Um, so the state thing is going to get the holdings and then we're gonna set state holdings to holdings. Um, so if I wanted to pass like multiple things into here, like this, that doesn't work. All the rest of those things get dropped off. So if I wanted to pass, um, I don't know, like a bunch of things in, uh, I would have to whoops, wrap this up into an object and then I could pluck those things off of here. Important to know, um, I was just working on the thing this weekend and I totally forgot about that. It took me a really long time to figure out that that was uh, a limitation. So be aware, if you get stuck, think about how many arguments you're giving the key mutator. Um, I don't really need to hold it in here. Sorry? Line 12 wrong? Line 12 is wrong. Uh, it's not wrong, we're just not using. Cool. That new line, so the linter's happy. And now, when we look at this, we see uh, we had our base state, and then we also see that the set holdings occurred. Uh, what's neat is we can actually roll back to the base state too, or roll back forward to when that mutation occurred. The, these dev tools are pretty awesome. Yeah, but I'm not gonna lie. Really nice. <laughs> and you have like copy buttons. And, is that a paste button? Yeah, so I can I can export and import state if I wanted to. I'm like a different tab or something. Uh, I think it does it to a file. It doesn't actually seem to do anything, though. I don't know why this it's doesn't work. But... Oh! Oh, dictionary. I don't want you. Uh, holy crap, it's in my... No, it's not. That's not actually the state. I don't think. I think it is. Oh, it's actually the state. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so then I assume that, yeah, I could just... Well, if, if the formatting worked right. Oh, wow. Awesome. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I guess I should be positioning this thing on the, that's, there we go, hooray. Yeah, so I can just throw some state in there. Um, and, really? Because it's literally what you just gave me. Anyway. I think it was updating as you typed it. It was using it while you were typing it. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah maybe. That's cool. Um, so I can also watch uh, events that occurred on all of my things. So, um, View has a built-in event emitter. Uh, that's how it handles like the, the click events and uh, loading events and you can do custom events and stuff as well. Uh, so this, this component happens to trigger a, uh, a handful of events and so I can watch those things occur and try to figure out what's going on in my app. Very nice. Um, yeah, so that is this simple application running on Vuex. Um, and you can see the Vuex state maps pretty closely to the component state, so it's pretty easy to, um, to get started with. Any question? One store per app? Yes, uh, so the store is a singleton. Uh, you, I mean, I guess you, no, you can't do multiple stores. You can do multiple view apps? Like you yeah, you can do multiple view apps. Views, yeah, like you just like view. inject view wherever you want, yeah. Well, but you were using view dot, dot use like on the static view object. If, if you wanted to do like multiple. Oh yeah, that's a good point. But he wasn't doing the, the create Store. Yeah, I wasn't so passing the store in. View. That's true. But this pizza phone store. Yeah, so I, I decorate the view instance to be able to handle the Vuex store, but I, I also explicitly pass in the store that I want it to have, right? Right. So yeah. you have multiple instances of view, but you can't necessarily have differently configured view View libraries. instances, yeah. So at least the, the middleware between one another has to be. Right. Um, so also, so any, any questions on that? Because there's a little bit further I can go with the dashboard thing. So just real quick, in terms of the, the Vuex store itself, it's probably the same as Redux, but I've never seen a fully fledged Redux or Vuex application. In terms of having like a ton of actions and mutators, is it just really amounts to a 2,000 line file? Is there no other way out? No, no, no I, I break it apart all the time. It's a separate file. Uh, yeah, so the, so here we have uh, our store, right? And we have created a new instance of this Vuex store. You can have as many, 
No, that's wrong. You can have one instance of a store, right. but you can uh, specify modules. Okay. Uh, and modules allow you to, so modules are, are an object just that you would basically shove into this store. So like all of that stuff can be a module. And then I can mount that module uh, into this store instance, um, optionally give it a namespace. I don't have to namespace modules, but it's helpful to usually, because usually if you're namespacing stuff, it means that things are large and you kind of want to contain things. Um, so it's, uh, so it's, uh, what is it? I think it's just like a modules property and then you pass in, um, uh, I don't remember the structure. I think maybe you give it a name or something. I don't know, you'd have to look at the docs. Maybe you could look at the docs. Um, yeah, view X modules. Look at this a lot. Modules are awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a modules property. Um, you give your module a name and then you just point to a module. And as you see here, it's literally just an object with state mutations, actions. So each module and, would have its own state, and then you would reference it right. store.state.module. Yep. Um, so. How deep does that go? Yeah, so it, it actually. It, it, Looks like it mixes the um, the module state onto the state under whatever name you gave it when you mounted it. Um, however, when you use so I'm, I'll show you some helpers and stuff that occur uh, or that that Vuex gives you as well. If you use um, here, I'm going to show you the things first, and then I can talk about how it's different with namespacing. So um, we're not using Git holdings anymore. So so far we've only used this uh, this this dollar sign store state, the, the dispatch and all that sort of stuff. There's actually uh, some nice shortcuts that uh, Vuex gives you to kind of sprinkle state into your component. Uh, one of them is called uh, map state, and there's another one called map actions. And we're gonna pull those off of the Vuex router, or Vuex uh, module. So map state allows us to basically do this in a little more concise way. So we can say we basically spread uh, our map state because map state is going to return an object, um, and we can give it the an array of the things that we want off of the Vuex state to basically just be mixed into this component. In this case, just the holdings, right? Um, you can also give things a new name. So if I wanted to, um, I don't know, rename this thing, I could use an object, and I could, I don't know, my fancy name thing, right, and have that point to holdings. And now inside this component, I would have a this dot my fancy name. Holdings would still be a string helper, correct? Uh, yes, it would. So in terms of uh, modules, you think it would be a dot holdings? So modules, the way that, th that those work, so let me show you, uh, so we have this, and then we can also, um, we can mix in uh, actions, and that structure of that is the same thing. Is it the same thing? Pretty sure it's the same thing. Um, Mix that action onto there, and now instead of dispatching this action, we have this just available on this component. And that now, will still invoke the action. Well, right. That's so. This is still talking to uh, the Vuex store. It's just a little more um, concise way to just like pluck things out of the store and make them available on the component. So if you're using namespacing, uh, this gets a little bit different. If I had a um, you know, I have my module A, right? There's a couple different ways I can refer to it. If this holdings thing was coming out of an A module, I can use this like slash syntax to say like, from the A namespace, pull the, the holdings value off of the state. Um, this gets a little cumbersome though if I'm like including a whole bunch of things, right? I have to keep doing this namespace and chances are my namespace is larger than A, so I have like, you know, blah, 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 whatever, slash some stupid thing, right? And I gotta keep typing that over and over. So there's actually a shortcut for this uh, where I can say the namespace that I want to pull things off of first, and now everything that I include in here is coming from that store, or that module, rather. You can include as many calls to map state as you want to. Yep, so yeah, so if, but yeah, if I wanted to pull like, you know, some other thing off of you know, B, um, yeah. that's the thing too. Um, and likewise with the, with the actions, if I had uh, namespace actions in there, same thing. The, the uh, API and these methods is all the same. Is the local name the same as the store name and you'd have to use the object syntax to rename it if you were pulling in like holdings from multiple stores. You have to say like you have to use the object syntax for the name to say like local No 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 so um, you define the name of your module when you mount that module. Right? Like you have two modules both with the name holdings in it. Right. You have the map 
If they're both exposing us the holdings property, you're erasing taxes against the sign. Oh, if, if, like if you're if you're prefixing that name instead of instead of. Do you have to prefix the name in the call to map modules, or does the assignment to the computed property does, is the computed property a dot holdings, or is the computed property just holdings? Oh, it's just holdings. Okay, so if you have holdings in multiple stores, yeah, you, you use the array. Right, you have to use the object things. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So the the name the namespace that you give the thing uh, is mounted here. And actually, uh, I thought maybe that's changed in a newer version. Yeah, I thought so. I'm not sure how that's different. So when you when you mount a module, you can if you just like use the module straight up, it will just be available in the store and it'll just mix it in. There's no namespacing. You have to explicitly opt into the namespacing uh, in your store. You can do nested modules inside of modules. Yes, you can. You can go as deep as you want. Wow. Full inception mode. <laughs> uh, yeah, Buix, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, yeah, Buix is, it, it took me a little long, I don't know, like a day or something to kind of get the hang of it. Um, but hopefully now that you've like seen it in action, uh, you can get started with it a little bit more quickly than I did. Um, so that is my live demo, and that's all I got for you. <laughs> uh, I have, I'll show these slides. There's a couple of resources that I have here, mostly the getting started docs for the different things. Uh, there's this intro to Vue.js from Sarah Drasner that I shared last time. I'll share it again because it's awesome. Uh, and then a link off to the video for the first part of this. So if none of the view pieces made sense to you, that might be helpful. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any other questions or anything or whatever. I'm happy to explore stuff. Um, yeah, view's, view's super easy, especially if you're coming from Angular. Uh, it, it fits really well to the mindset you already have, but you get all of the benefits of React. You get the fast virtual DOM, you get the state diffing, all that sort of stuff. Um, you get server-side rendering is pretty easy to pull off. It's fun. It was awesome. One thing that I was curious about, as far as its comparison to, to Angular, is, is whether or not there's a scope for elements that you've imported, like when you're using elements. Yes. Template. So you you can so uh, in the router when I do the view use thing, right. it's injecting components globally. Yeah. But you can um, so say I had like a component that I was trying to use uh, in this dashboard, um, I can import said components. So I come whatever from components comp, right? Or comp.view. Sure. Um, and then I say like in this component, I'm going to make these components available. This is just an object. And I just say like now I have this comp component. Uh, and then in my markup, I can just, you know, custom element or custom tag comp, right? And if I if I had like... Uh, do you think it's possible to do that instead of view.use? To keep it completely local and have no like access to Static properties in the view? Probably not in like the router and maybe not the well the state the router doesn't the make state sense, probably but... too because you have to like what the component has to know about changes in the state. And I'm sure that there's some wiring up and stuff that's happening in that call. I'm I'm, I'm describing more of the like root of the application kind of thing. Like at, at a root level where you could say like basically use these modules from here now and potentially different modules from here now and something. But the like the, the state's doing more than just injecting components, right? It's injecting like all the lifecycle stuff that Vuex right. is, is exposing, tying those into the view component. Oh, it would definitely have, it wouldn't be using the components object for sure. I, I was kind of hoping there was like maybe a use property that you could just assign on a view component. Oh, not that and I like know. I don't. I don't think, think so. But yeah, this, uh, what, what's kind of neat is even though the property on this components thing is capitalized and double capitalized, um, HTML is case insensitive, right? And so you saw this in, in Angular too, where like, I, I, well, whatever, you see this in normal markup, which is like, Whoa, like, this is totally a valid tag. And as far as everything is concerned, this is all lowercase. So how do I, how do I deal with this, right? This, this like double capitalized thing, but actually we'll turn it into like the, the, is a snake case or whatever? Case. The kebab case. Um, and I can use it either way. So I could use this component capitalized, and it'll know that this is the component that I mean. But I can also use it because it, it, it does that, and because things are case insensitive, like this is the same component too. Like um, it, it just, like, 
it knows that like it needs to expose it both ways, I guess. And I have a feeling that the um, the non kebab case version of it is probably going to go away in future versions of you because there's really no reason for it to be there. Um, but this does work like that. That would load. Does it actually use an component. HTML element with that with the name kebab with the comp comp in kebab case? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it produces a um, a custom element for both. So it's not all virtual. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just like like Why in virtual DOM. Wait, it's a see an it, like it's an element that you can create, right? It's just like, like in React, the like browsers like create. Or are you talking? No, 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 it doesn't. It, sorry, it, it's not using like like an X tags or like an actual yeah. web component thing. It, it's it's like instantiating the module as this name that you can uh, use, right? So but in the in the resulting DOM that that, that view renders to, if you look in the, the generic the standard Chrome inspector, would you see an element that has comp comp and you can think about kids? Does oh. it actually use that name? That's a good question. Uh, let's do. Let's try it with this. So I have I have this dashboard card component that I'm already. Can you close it with a different JSON? <laughs> <laughs> let's find out. All right. So now this nope. is complaining. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Wait. It said something about. What is it complaining I about? Yeah. It has no matching closing tags. What is that? Did I? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is still maybe a functioning thing. Oh, I don't know why it's still talking console. about. Oh, because I have all the just garbage that I like sprinkled on here. Mm. Oh, the maps too. Yeah. Uh, so let's fix this so we get back to a working application. Just so we can see if whoops, things are actually going to load correctly. Cool. So now if I go dashboard card, dashboard card. So that still works. If I, let's make the D capitalized. That does not work. Ah, yeah, so it must be, it must only be named. So what does this show up as? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. It, yeah, it, it doesn't, yeah, it throws yeah, so all that stuff that's away. Why I was, that's what I was imagining, and that's why I, I challenged the idea that there needs to be a kebab case and <laughs> But it's, yeah, whatever, you can use it either way. Kebab case looks more like web components, and this, that's what this spec is like supposed to look like, so. But you don't have to use them if you don't want to. Um, I can also like because it's uh, where the heck is it? Yeah, this guy. So because this is an object, I can like I can give this thing another name, right? Um, and so now I have like a, a Spencer object instead of this dashboard card. And so oh, I can. That's awesome. Whoops! Uh, I gotta, there we go. I have my sweet my sweet Spencer cards. Which is handy because, like, if, if I'm importing uh, a thing with like some stupid long name, right. I can give it a much shorter name. And yeah. is the name of dashboard cards dictated by the module dashboard cards at all, or is, is it uh, purely based on what you how you import it? So you do give it a name. Um, okay. Yeah. So I have this name, but so I don't no entirely know. What the name is used for? It's used in some contexts. Well, I, I imagine but, it was the default. Oh, but no, because it was an object to begin with. So right. It's just using. The and this, honestly, like this name bit is optional. This thing will work completely fine without it. Really um, the name of the file almost because you're. Yeah, it's it's. You. Because I imported it uh, as, you know, as a thing, right? I'm importing this thing. Right. You could probably change dashboard card right at the top of the um, your main file to something else and. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, totally. Well, especially when you're like, using the yeah, because I because I'm using like default exports anyway, so right. like and you're using the shortcut syntax yeah. to to just set the key to whatever the value right. is. So, yeah. so now like that also works. I still have my Spencer component because I named it when I imported it. And components can't like be an array or anything like that. I don't know why. Components can't be an array. Uh, like the the way so you it include components. Array, if it was just an array. Yeah, no, it has to be an object. All had name properties or something like that. Like maybe that would be why, but yeah. So your components could be completely unnamed, but they're just kind of assumed based on the file name, and the person who imports it can determine what they're going to name it locally. Yeah, but the, yeah, there, like there's certain debugging situations where I don't know. I've come across situations where like this name is important to have. What the name, what the value of it, it doesn't ex exactly matter, but obviously you want to be able to refer back to where it came from. I bet if it doesn't have a name, it uses the local name. But if the local name is different in six different places, it'll present as six different components in the debugger rather than. Yeah, but even even like in here, um, it shows up. Well, I change it back, but I can. Uh, whoops, wrong file. Oh, come on. Yeah, get this way. So 
we'll do Spencer, there's this guy, and then Spencer that up. And so now if we look in here, we see a bunch of Spencers. Okay. So it's not using the that name here. Yeah. Well, with the capital X, interestingly enough. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why they capitalize it, it's funky. Uh, Yeah, I could, uh... Hmm. I like the J-Spence, doesn't matter. You like it? Just start calling you J-Spence, that's cool. Oh, so it does use that name here. Oh wait, Tristan, you, you just overrided it in the component, and now I just changed it to use the... I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's the casing. Yeah, it is. Okay, so if I use if I use the kebab case, then it gets ignored. Whatever. Nope. It doesn't. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so whatever changed last. <laughs> Moral of the story is put a name on your components. <laughs> we got a random question. Yeah. Inside your store, you export as a function, and so inside app dot view, you instantiated it. Yeah. So inside your router, if you import store, you get that function. Yeah, and it's going to make a new instance of it. A second one. How did I do that before? Because I definitely did that. You expose a function from your router as well, and then you pass the store in as the argument for the router to create router. Uh, I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Dependencies are... Export. <laughs> store. Uh, oh, that's why. So the only thing that matters is the order, right? And so the reason that I have to export a function here um, is because I'm importing this thing before I uh, am exposing it to view, right? So, so yeah, so if you move that, that mix-in bit into the store itself, then you can mix it in first and then instantiate it. And now the only thing that ever gets exposed is this one instance of the store. So, so this, this is my like store index file, right? And it's in here, I'm including both view and viewx. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I do is mix viewx into view. Okay. Then I create the store. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, in the other app, so like in this main file, um, I, don't, I don't mess with like injecting the router or the state or anything. I just have the view instance, and I, I, mm -hmm. this router bit could be off anywhere, too. Um, so and then I, I knew up the view instance. View X, because you have the store and you have the main app in the same file, then yeah. you can reference each other because they're local variables inside that launch port. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, because it like the, the code's gonna execute in order, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing it's gonna do is mix in view X to view, and then it's mm -hmm. gonna instantiate the view store. Or the view X store. Yeah. That makes sense. So that's probably the better way to do it, because then you can't expose that store object. Which is important. Um, because mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have like my stores you know, getters something, right? Like, I I don't have access to this dollar sign store. As far as I know, I don't have access to that in this function. Should we call it a wrap and keep the people here in this question? Sure, I'm good with that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not opposed to keeping people here against their will, but. <laughs> <laughs> what is getters? You didn't talk about when Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so getters uh, in Vuex is very similar to computer properties in view components. So you, in a getter, you can read um, values off of your state and maybe calculate other values. So if you use um, selectors and stuff at all in, in Redux, which you should, because selectors make Redux tolerable. Um, Have you really felt <laughs> I hate Redux. I hate Redux. Um, that's just a man's opinion. Uh, so yeah, you have access to, uh, sorry, that's the, so it gives you the, the state and then you can read properties off the state and do other things. Um, and so like I use that in oh, my authentication thing. So the if is authenticated is really checking to see like is the value of the user state null or not. It's a really dumb, stupid check, but it's just a dumb example. Is there a way to persist state in the store? Like local store is back to UX? Yes. Uh, so there are still uh, much like like Redux has like a middleware hook, Vuex has the same thing. So there is, and I use it in this project actually. Um, yeah, this persist thing. So you can 
when you new up your store, you can say you can give it plugins to use and like give the plugins definitions and everything. Um, and so here, if I can just use um, create persistent straight up, it would just it would be a string in that plugin, and it would know how to map it. Oh no, it would still be an object. Anyway, um, here what I'm doing is uh, when I when I get the state or when I set the state, uh, I use this like LZ compress decompress thing, so I can fit more stuff in the local storage. Um, it's just a little custom implementation. I don't actually have to do it. I don't put much in local storage, but I wanted to figure out how to do it, so I did it. <laughs> Yeah, can we do some raffles so, here? Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Oh, wait, I thought everybody's going to leave. Yeah, get out of here. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out, everybody.